And I want to say one thing about uh, this final battle that will take place one of these days during the days of the tribulation there at Megiddo. Uh, that's the battlefield of the world, Megiddo. There in the Old Testament, Barak and Deborah fought against Sisera. It was there that Gideon fought against the Midianites. It was there that Saul was slain at the hand of the Philistines. It was there that Ahaziah was slain by the arrows of Jehu. Uh, there Pharaoh Nacho slew good king Josiah. It was there that Jeremiah lamented the slain of the armies of Josiah. And through the ages since, each battle fought there, whether by the Drusus or the Turks or the armies of Napoleon, Napoleon is a harbinger of the great day of the battle of God Almighty. And so that battlefield over there, 200 miles long, 100 miles wide, will be the final battle one of these days where all of that will take place. For tonight in Revelation chapter 11, I want us to begin in verse number, uh, chapter 19, uh, verse 11 for tonight. In Revelation chapter 19 verse 11 through 21 for this evening. Hopefully we'll get through that much of it, but let me read verse uh, 11 through 21. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And that's in that great valley I just read about. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast. And those who worshiped his image, these two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Tonight, I want us to look at the priority of his return. There are many, there are more than eight times as many references to the second coming of Christ as there are to his first coming. In fact, some 1,845 uh, by one account that are references to the second coming. It's mentioned some 321 times in the New Testament. And in 17 of the Old Testament books and 23 of the 27 of the New Testament books, seven out of every um, 10 New Testament chapters mention the second coming in one out of every 30 verses. Jesus referred to his own return 21 times. It's mentioned more than any other subject in the New Testament except for salvation. Now, tonight, as we look, first of all, I want you to see the prediction of the return of Christ. 
Number one, the prediction of the return of Christ. Do we have that? There you go. The prediction of Christ's return. Now, even though the phrase, the second coming of Christ, it's not found in the Bible, it's inferred in many places. For example, in Hebrews 9, 27 and 28, he will appear, the Bible says, a second time. In the Bible, there are seven key passages that predict that, predict that the Lord will return to the earth. And these passages represent almost every section of the Bible, spanning the ages from Enoch there in the book of Genesis to John the Apostle in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. I want us to look first of all at Enoch tonight in Jude verse 14. You know that Jude only has one chapter in it. And uh, in verse 14, it says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. You see, Enoch there uh, is the earliest record we have of someone that was prophesying about the return of Christ. And Enoch is over there in uh, the book of Genesis. According to Jude, Enoch said, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all the ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That's in uh, Jude verse 14 and verse 15. And then over in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, Daniel saw the following in a vision. I was watching in the night visions. And behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and that's a reference to God, and they brought him near before him. Look at verse 14. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, speaking of Jesus, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. And then in the book of Zechariah, once again, over in the Old Testament, Zechariah 14, verses 3 through 4, then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. That's speaking about that final battle over there that I read about where it's going to take place. And in that day, his feet will stand where? On the Mount of Olives. That's where he ascended back to heaven. Uh, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives, notice, shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And then notice Jesus, we have this reference, he described his return Coming back to the earth in Matthew chapter 24, verse 27, Jesus said, For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. And then notice, if you will, in verse 29 to 31, immediately after the tribulation of those days, Jesus is speaking here, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the power of powers of the heavens will be shaken. Verse 31. Uh, do we have that, Martha? Verse 31. And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather to gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And then Revelation chapter 22 and verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I'm coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Now, when it says, Surely I'm coming quickly, when John wrote this back in AD 95, as most Bible scholars believe it was written back then, he didn't mean he was coming right then. He just meant that when he's coming, that it's imminent, he will 
come again one of these days. So we have Jesus telling, him, telling us himself about his coming. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, uh, speaking of the angels to the disciples, they said, and while they, those disciples, looked steadfastly toward heaven as Jesus went up, behold, two men, these are angels, stood by them, those disciples, in white apparel. And then Paul, when writing to the Thessalonican church in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10, in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, uh, Paul wrote this, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Notice verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9. Uh, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And then he says in verse 10, when he comes, when Jesus comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. And then in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, John said, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. And so the fact of the return of Jesus Christ to the earth is well documented throughout the Scripture. And it only remains to look further to establish the details that begin with the place of Jesus' return. When Jesus went back to heaven, 40 days after the resurrection, he went to the Mount of Olives. Those disciples were standing there. And as Jesus ascended into the clouds to go back into heaven, and those two angels were standing there telling them, why do you stand gazing into the heaven? This same Jesus is coming back in so like manner as you've seen him go. So the place of his return, according to Zechariah, once again an Old Testament reference, we see in Zechariah chapter 14 verse 4, and in that day, in what day? In the day that he comes back in the second coming, in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall split in two. Now notice he says, from east to west, making a very large valley, half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. So these angels are standing on the Mount of Olives confirmed to those disciples when Jesus ascended back into heaven. Uh, those angels let those disciples know that Jesus would return back to that place as we see in Acts chapter 1 verse 11 and verse 12. We see where it's recorded there as well in spite of this evidence. Peter tells us there were many in his day, and there are certainly many in our day, who doubt that Christ would return. And asking this question from 2 Peter 3, 3 through 4, where is the promise of his coming? Almost everything about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is certain, except for the time, which is known only by God creator of heaven and earth, Matthew 24, verse 36, we are told that. So the place of his return is the Mount of Olives. We don't know when, but we know he's coming again. And then tonight, let's look at the uh, preparation for his return, or excuse me, the portrayal for his return. Revelation 
chapter 19 gives us great detail here about the king of kings and his descent to the earth. And it gives a, a description of his appearance. Verse 11 in our text tonight, John said, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. In John's day, in those days that John's writing, A.D. 95, in John's day a white horse was a symbol of victory. Oftentimes it would be ridden by the conquering Roman general in victory as he would enter back into the city. And so Christ here on a white horse is definitely appropriate for the conquering king of kings and lord of lords. And, and uh, John writes, behold, he's coming with clouds, with clouds. Every time the skies are filled with the clouds out there and they're moving or, or the skies filled with clouds even stationary to us. I always look and think about the song, uh, Steve, uh, what a beautiful day for the Lord to come again. In fact, Ray Ledbetter and I was talking yesterday at a meeting Alex and I had gone to over at Bethel Assembly of God with a bunch of pastors and youth ministers, and, and after it was over, Ray and I were talking, and we, uh, I said, yeah, Ray, that reminds me of the song, what a beautiful day for the Lord to come again. Behold, he's coming with clouds Every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. And that amen means so be it. You see, in John's day, it would have been preposterous to say that every eye, every human being on earth will see Christ descend from the clouds. But today, today, there's not a problem with that. All over the world with satellite, television, and with everything that's going on, you, you see Christ, the victor, will look like no other warrior ever. Notice how his eyes are. Revelation 19, 12, and 13 tells us his eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. Look in verse 13. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called, notice, the Word of God. Uh, his names. Christ is called the Word of God. That's another phrase we see in the Bible for his name. Jesus is a tangible, meaning you're able to touch that, something that's tangible, Jesus is a tangible expression of the invisible God. Remember when Jesus told his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so back in that Old Testament, nobody could look upon the face of God or they would die. But let me tell you, when Jesus came in the New Testament, Jesus is the express image of the invisible God. And so we see uh, the word of God as being his name. Notice he's also called faithful and true. Pilate asked the question, what is truth? Many young people today are asking the same question. A lot of kids today are asking, what is truth? Yesterday in our discussion, we were talking about how do you reach the younger crowd in this present world filled with all kinds of technological gadgets. And everywhere you go, people's on their phones. I tell you, I, I believe if people lost their phone, they would have an absolute conniption fit. Think about that. Everywhere I was today, I saw people crouching in the corner so they wouldn't get caught, and they're on their phones. And people are either looking at Facebook or they're texting. Or they're doing something. And uh, while I believe that the cell phone is a great technological invention, I'm grateful I can remember the days when I would drive 
to and from Duncan to Oklahoma City to visit hospitals, and I would have to stop on the turnpike at McDonald's to use a payphone to call somebody I needed to call from the church. Boy, I'm glad now all I have to do is just tell Siri, call so-and-so. Now I get a little aggravated at her because half the time she gets mixed up and she and I have to have a little come to Jesus meeting. But I, I don't know what we would do without cell phones, honestly. I am grateful for them because they are great, a great uh, invention. But the question was asked, what do we do about these kids? One of the youth ministers said, well, I don't think it's this younger group uh, in high school that, uh, that is hard for us to reach. It's that group from 18 to 25 and 30 that's gone off to college and then they come back and decide that the Bible is not true. And my comment was, I don't think the church, and I'm speaking of churches, plural, all over the United States, I don't think the church has done a great job in teaching apologetics. Why do we believe that the Bible is true? Somebody came up to you and said, do you believe the Bible's true? Yes, I believe the Bible. Well, why do you think it's true? Prove to me, prove to me why you think it's true. I guarantee you, among Southern Baptists, I'll isolate it down to that, I bet you 98% could not tell somebody why. Let me tell you, just to tell somebody because it's true, that don't cut it anymore. In the world that you and I live in, people don't accept that anymore. Tell me why it's true. Where's the proof? What is it that makes you know that the Bible's true? And I don't think we've done a good job schooling our people about why the Bible's true. You know, we don't get into all of the uh, mechanics of about the 5,000 copies that they have and the 13,000 of other copies that they have. And about 98, 99% of all of that is correct and, and relates and agrees with each other. What, what that other percent or one and a half percent relates to is just spelling errors or errors in punctuation. And they're not errors beyond some of those type of things. But most people, if you just walk up and said, in the 21st century, tell me why you believe the Bible's true. Well, I just believe it's true. That doesn't cut it with people today. Not that college age group of kids that are going off to colleges and universities where they are taught a secular worldview. Now, I believe the Bible other than all of the things that we have, I believe it by faith. If you'll remember, faith is the reality of something that we hope for, but the evidence of things not seen. I believe it by faith, but I also believe it because of all of the things that we have from the mechanics of biblical scholarship and studies from the early fathers and all of the parchments that have been found and for all of those reasons. But I can assure you today, it's hard <clears throat> to, um, to assure people that you either trust that as truth or where do you hang your hat on truth? Pilate said when they brought Jesus, what is truth? You know, Jesus had said in the book of John, chapter 14, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And if you'll notice, on, on his appearance, we're told that he has written faithful and true. Faithful and true. He's written on his thigh another name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, verse 16 there. That was a familiar phrase over there in the ancient world of that day. Ezra 7, 12 in the Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, and then 
uh, Christ was, will come as King of kings and Lord of lords, and every knee will bow before him. Isaiah 45, 23, Romans 14, 11, Philippians 2, 10, and 11. And then notice about his eyes. Let me just make one other point. In a seminary class in systematic theology that I was taking, we talked about all of the apologetics and why we believe that the Bible is true. But somewhere along the way, I guess in our pulpits that we've, we've never just really used those things to express and expound upon the fact of why the Bible is true. Notice his eyes are flames of fire. Revelation 1.14, Revelation 2.18, Revelation 19.12. Meaning his gaze sees through and destroys all that is false in the world and in the heart of mankind. Let me tell you, when Christ returns, he's going to see through the motives and the methods of every earthly ruler who's opposed the work and the will of God. Notice his crowns. When Christ came the first time, he was crowned with a crown of thorns. At his second coming, the Bible says here in verse 12, he'll be wearing many crowns which signify power and authority of his rule. He, in effect, will wear the crown of every nation on the earth. In other words, whether uh, what that means about all those crowns, it certainly means that he will be filled with power and with authority. And then notice on his robe, his robe dipped in blood. What is that a picture of? It's a picture of redemption. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I told Mike and Susie yesterday in my office that I could baptize somebody a hundred times up there, but water doesn't have anything to do with salvation. Water is a picture of going down into the water, being buried with Christ. In other words, you are burying an old way of life and you are rising in the resurrection of Christ to a new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's a picture of a changed life. Notice his robe is dipped in blood, speaks of redemption. He secured for you and me on the cross as the lamb that's slain. And for all eternity, we will celebrate the shed blood which was brought about by our redemption from the penalty of sin. I believe that, uh, in fact, er earlier in the book of Revelation, we see in chapter 13, verse 8, he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And when it speaks about his robe is dipped in blood, I believe that we will see that for all eternity to remember why we are in heaven because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the people that will be with him when he returns one of these days. Now, as Christ returns, we'll see the armies, plural, of heaven. They're clothed in fine linen, white and clean. We're following him on white horses, According to verse 14 here in Revelation 19, these armies will be made up of believers from all ages. Now, the Old Testament, New Testament, and tribulation martyrs, Zechariah described the same armies, calling them holy ones. Now, you're going to say, well, wait a minute, Pastor, I thought the Old Testament saved are going to be resurrected at the end of the tribulation. And they are. But evidently, their spirit is with Christ. In fact, do you remember the song that we sing at Easter? I love this song. It's one of my favorite of all of the Easter songs. Christ the Lord is risen today. There's a phrase that says, he has opened paradise. 
That's where the saved go. Paradise. In the Old Testament, remember, there was two compartments. The Hebrew word for the realm of the dead or the grave. The Hebrew word was sheo, S-H-E-O-L. But there was a compartment of that that was not a place of punishment. It was a place where the saved went, those that were looking to the cross by faith. And a lot of Bible scholars believe that when Christ was buried in, in between uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection, that Christ went and preached uh, into the lower parts and that he rescued those whose spirits had gone there. He has opened paradise. And we, when we sing Alleluia. And so, however that may be. So, if, if those Old Testament saints are coming back with us, I'm not sure how those horses, how those uh, spirits, those souls will be on white horses, but you know, God is God. If he wants to give them a temporary body to ride back on, he can do it. I don't have to worry about it. But their body will be resurrected at the end of the tribulation. So I don't have any problem worrying about how that's all going to happen. So the white linen worn by the armies represents the righteousness of the saints because for the, white, the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Remember last uh, Sunday night we talked about works why we are saved to do good works. When we wear those white, they will be the righteous acts of the saints. We will be forever uh, in righteousness with Christ and Christ alone. Jesus wears blood-stained stained garments so that the redeemed can wear the fine white linens of righteousness these legions, these armies, are dressed not in military fatigues, but in dazzling white. Let me tell you, I don't know about you, but if you can only imagine whenever that group of untold millions will be fighting each other and fighting Israel, and all of heaven opens up, the Bible says every eye is going to sing. Every tongue is going to confess. They're going to have to acknowledge that he is Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, even though it's too late for them as they turn to think they can fight against the great King of kings and the Lord of lords. I don't know about you, do you see the picture? Sharon and Keith sang the other day, what a day, glorious day that will be. Can you only imagine? All of a sudden, the heavens open in the east, and here comes the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords riding out on a conquering white charger. I don't think you and I can even begin to imagine what that white charger is going to look like you talk about you talk about a picture of strength and muscle on an animal the whole world is going to look up and see the armies of heaven coming with Jesus the angels the saints of God coming out of heaven's glory and all that that's going to be let's look at the return the purpose of his return for tonight, and uh, it'll be an amazing picture one of these days. The purpose of Christ's return is to summarize Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. In righteousness, he judges and makes war. Let me tell you, that word, the sharp sword that proceeds from his mouth there in verse 15, the sword does not represent uh, an instrument but it's speaking about the Word of God. He will absolutely speak the Word of God. Remember, the Word is the sword. The Bible says the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. 
All he has to do is speak the word. And let me tell you, they will crumble to their feet. Jude describes Christ's purpose as to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly, Jude 15 to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way. Look at the three words, ungodly, ungodly, ungodly. And of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Why is he coming? He's coming to judge the ungodliness of this world and for those that have rejected him and also uh, for the salvation of Israel as well. Ungodly appears four times. What a dramatic picture. Notice the punishment at his return. Uh, chapter 19 tonight, verse 17 and 18 and verse 21. Then I saw an angel. Boy, we've seen angels all the way through the book of Revelation, what are angels? Hebrews tells us they are ministering spirits to those who will inherit salvation. And they are created by God. They weren't created for salvation. The Bible says they desire to look into salvation. But the Bible also says that when a sinner comes to Jesus, the angels of heaven rejoice. But let me tell you, these angels were created and God's going to use them to dispatch the various judgments upon this world. And notice it tells us there, then I saw an angel standing in the sun. I can only imagine what that angel must look like. To our eyes, it's going to be some gigantic created being. And notice what this angel does. He cries, cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds, no wonder Jesus said, look at the birds. They don't worry. Look at the lilies of the field. They, they neither toil nor, nor spin. One of these days, not only are you, you and I going to be invited to uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb, but at the close of the tribulation, an angel is announcing to all of the created order of the carrion, the birds, in the midst of heaven. And what's this angel crying out to them? Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. Let me tell you, notice in verse uh, uh, 18, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. Can you only imagine? Look in verse 21. And the rest, the rest, speaking about the rest, were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. What a picture. What a picture. And then I want us to look at the penalty at his return in closing Verse 20 and 21, notice into what happens to, then the beast was captured, with him the false prophet. This is at the end of the tribulation. These are the first two, by the way, that are cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And then we're told the rest were killed with the sword. That'll be the mouth of God speaking the word, and they will be killed the word captured literally means to grab or to snatch. And when Christ returns, he's going to grab the Antichrist, the beast, the one world dictator. He's going to grab the Antichrist and that false 
prophet that led the world into a false, apostate, godless religion. And the Bible says that they are going to be cast into hell. Notice verse 41 of Matthew 45. The place, hell, the place prepared for whom? The devil and his angels. Now, Satan will join them at the end of the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. And then Revelation chapter 20, verse 10 says, For all eternity, the unholy trinity there, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation gives a sobering look at the return of Christ. Let me tell you, one of these days, judgment is coming to this world. The other day, I saw on a video, they were showing on the news, where a homeless man was sitting on the side of the sidewalk. And there was a person that came up, filled his pistol with a round, and just reached over and shot him. And it was on camera. Let me tell you, the world is filled with ungodly, wicked, lawlessness. But I'll tell you, the hope of the world, Christ is coming again. And let me tell you, when he comes, he is going to vindicate. He's going to vindicate and he is going to bring the execution needed upon this world for the rejection of Christ, the ungodliness, the wickedness, the unlawfulness that is in this world this evening. Folks, let me tell you, Christians have something to shout about, amen? We've got something to rejoice in I serve a risen Savior. One of these days, he's going to split the eastern sky. And when he does, the host of heaven, the armies of heaven are going to come. If you can only imagine, Hollywood could never in a hundred million years produce a scene like is coming to this world one of these days. I'm just grateful I'm on, on board, aren't you? God bless you.